Good afternoon and welcome to the Music Magpie PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Steve Oliver, CEO. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everybody. Thank you for giving up your time on a Friday late lunchtime uh, when the pubs are undoubtedly open. Maybe you uh, can go and get a beer after this. I, I perhaps will because it's been a, uh, an interesting three days, um, including breaking my fingers playing football last night, uh, which is my latest uh uh, injury. Anyway, um, listen, thanks, as I say, for joining. We're going to try and leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So we, we're going to try and whistle through the uh, slides as quickly as we can. We've got myself and Matt Fowler, our CFO, on. Um, I've got three or four intro slides. Matt will give us some financial highlights uh, and a little bit more detail. And then I'll go through some of the strategic uh, goals and a bit of finish with a bit of an outlook. So uh, I, I do, of course, know that some of you have heard this story before. Some of you know the, the business better than others. Um, but I will just do these couple of intro slides. Um, so how do we position ourselves? You know, I've done a lot of talking to journos, including Ian King yesterday afternoon, about where we position ourselves. There is clearly a lot of talk, again, about consumer household budgets. We survived COVID. We went into energy cost crisis. We've now got the interest rate, mortgage rate. Um, issues very much hitting many hundreds of thousands of households. We are here to help. We were born in a recession. We prospered again in the pandemic when people needed us both to help them raise cash for their old stuff and to save money buying refurbished tech with confidence and trust that they can do from us. So that's how we position ourselves. You know, Martin Lewis promotes our business heavily. You know, I'm sure you come across other businesses that talk about being recession resistant. I think we're even a little bit more than that. We can potentially really position ourselves as being here to help uh, in those tough climates. So, and that third box talks about spreading the cost. We'll tell you about both our rental proposition, which does that, and also a buy now, pay later, uh, which more and more we're gonna be bringing to the prominence uh, of our offer. And then also just a couple of nods to, you know, uh, smart for the planet, as well as being smart for you. Um, we aim very much to, to make our service very ESG friendly, sustainable, increasing awareness of uh, recycling and the dangers of e-waste. You may remember we did a big sculpture last year, Mount Recycle More. We're continuing to lead that agenda on the talk of you know how we can provide a circular economy for our consumer tech and our old products. And of course, contributing to our community and our charities are also very important to us. I think the next slide, I can probably whistle through fairly quickly. It's just our circular economy. It's our business model. Just in case there's anybody new on the line, the right-hand side is our sell journey, fixed valuation, free logistics, payment on arrival in our warehouse. So as long as it is what you said it was and in the condition it was, um, we will pay you on arrival in our warehouse. That is our price promise. If we disagree with how you've sold it to us and the condition and you want that product back, we send it back FOC. We do obviously check for lost, stolen uh, phones and outstanding finance uh, before passing that through. Halfway down at six o'clock on the clock, it talks about paying the consumer and then refurbishing that item. Whether it's an old school, and we, have, um, we will mention in passing our dis and media but, uh, business, um, but now ever more so, we do a more complicated refurbish and repair on the consumer tech items before um, passing that through for resale or now renting. We'll tell you how we're looking to sell more, um, buy more on the right hand side, sell more and rent more on the left hand side, um, and everything is resold with a 12 month warranty. Trust, it remains at the very heart of our business. And I think that's ever so more important when new customers are coming to site and it might be the first time they've looked to raise cash or save money with us. I think just some updated bullets and stats. A um, number of you will be familiar with these. And it's, uh, I guess that top left one plays to our consumer champion credentials. 
in our history. I do stress that's not this year's spend uh, that we've given customers in our history. We've paid out well over four hundred million pounds of tax free cash to consumers for their rolled stuff, mainly tech, but also some disc media in there still. And we've now paid fifteen million of that via our smart truck kiosk. And we're going to tell you more about those because we're gaining really good momentum with the kiosks, mainly in Asda stores, but I'll come back to that. In that middle column, sell more. I think, you know, long-standing viewers will know I've talked about we are the biggest seller in the world in the history of Amazon and eBay. Slightly surreal statement, but it is a true one. We have 17 million feedbacks, positive feedbacks on eBay and 11 million on Amazon. So we have scaled the business historically on the platforms but now very much our, our primary choice of where we want to sell our product is on our own store. And 79% of our UK tech is sold via our own store. And that's gone back up from where we were 12 months ago. I'll come back to that. Finally, on the right hand side, just an update on rent, 39,000 subscribers. That's up from 24,000 a year ago. The average monthly rental subscription remains around that 20 pounds. But we're gonna spend time today just trying to give you a bit more education on who we're renting to, who we're selling to, and how we feel about that net debt, because we do know that there are people out there, including ourselves, who are very focused on that debt, net debt number, especially now interest rates are higher. So we will uh, be very much coming back to that. And then just our trust credentials at the bottom, we're up to 9 million registered users. We have won another mobile award, um, and uh, Trustpilot, having just looked, uh, looked when I was eating my lunchtime sandwich, we're up at 265,000 reviews on Trustpilot, which we're very proud of indeed, and talks to those trust credentials. So I think I'm going to come back to most of the things we just talked about. I think, Matt, we're probably ready just to go through some summary numbers. Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just got five slides here, um, and I'd just like to pull out the main bullets rather than going down uh, item by item. So just here on the slide, the highlights, just uh, hopefully what you'll have seen into and read into our interim statement uh, very much for the internal focus for the period has been on profits and cash. We've had a sort of simple approach uh, trying to buy and sell for more margin. And as highlighted on this slide, this focus has pretty much delivered as we intended. So group gross margin increased 3.1% to just under 30% of the consumer technology gross profit of 10.9 million pounds in absolute terms, up from 9.6 in 2022. Uh, below gross margin, very pleased with an almost 1 million reduction in overheads. And that's despite this cost inflationary in market externally that's facing us all. These margin and overhead improvements led to an EBITDA, which was 7.7 .7 up, 2.8 million. And that's after a relatively poor Q1 that we previously announced. And we'll come back to that later. In terms of uh, our segments, moving to consumer technology, which we separate out into our outright sale business and our rental business. Um, really pleasing metric at the top there, gross profit up 13.5% to 10.9 million pounds. And that's despite a slight revenue reduction, a 1.3 million increase in profit. And that's been delivered by this concept of buying and selling for more margin. So buying cheaper, more sourcing from consumers and less sourcing from B2B and selling what we'd call better for more margin through the Music Magpie store and also more effective use of third party platforms. Just referencing back that comment about Q1. So revenue during Q1 was slightly um, affected by consumer confidence around December and January period and some of the issues around postal strikes. Um, and there's a specific comment there about 1.1 million of sales loss just specifically being related to the last posting date in 22 being much earlier than 21. Um, in addition to that on gross margin improvements we have an increasing mix of rental in the overall consumer technology segment and you can see there a total of 39,000 renters up from 24,000 in May 22, and they gave a revenue of 4 million and a nice healthy gross profit of 4.3 million from that segment of the business. If you look at the rental numbers Q1, Q2, you'll see there was a stronger um, acceleration of growth in Q1, slightly less so in Q2, which is intentional, and that's been a strategic 
intention from us and Steve will come on to that a little later when we talk about rental strategically. Moving on to this media and books, which is our legacy category, our sort of cash cow. Um, in terms of highlights on there, I guess there is a sales decline. We are guiding to a 10% year over year decline because of the nature of the category. Um, in particular, this period had a reasonably tough comparative owing to the prior year having st still got some tailwinds from COVID and the various lockdowns. But the strong point for us, final comment there on gross profit. So despite the um, changes through the segment, resilient gross margin, 36%. So still a significant contribution to the group. Pulling those uh, two segments together and just moving down to the um, income statement. So I've talked about uh, revenue and gross margin. Just below that, operating expenses, 0 0.8 million year over year saving. And that's from this concerted focus on profit and costs. So about half of that delivered from the general corporate overhead and no stone unturned in terms of looking at costs, subscriptions, every penny. And the other half from marketing. So not only an absolute saving year over year, but more effective marketing, because despite that shift in spend, we've managed to drive a higher proportion of sales to the Music Magpie store. So from a prior year, 70 odd percent up to 79 in 23. So it's paid off in terms of that gross margin improvement. So after operating expenses and gross margin, EBITDA was 2.8 million and that's 7.7 .7 ahead of prior year. And linking again to the Q1, Q2, Q1 was poor, but in terms of EBITDA, Q2 was up 42% on 22. So we have a very nice exit rate from H1 into H2, and we continue to see that momentum. And just to reiterate for those less familiar with the story, so H2 owing to peak trading around Black Friday and Christmas is a much more important weighted period for us. A couple of comments just about the items below EBITDA. So depreciation, amortization, impairment. Uh, these are pretty much um, percentage related to the rental assets. So as we've grown the rental asset base from 6.6 .6 million in 22 to pretty much double 12.2 at May 23, these metrics move in line. Finally, on to um, cash flow. Overall, it's a pretty similar pattern and pretty similar profile year over year. We have a very short working capital cycle. So smartphones tend to be in the warehouse less than 10 days before they're sold. And we manage that obviously very tightly. So the majority of EBITDA falls down through to operating cash flow. The big driver or the domination on the cash flow is, is CapEx. And within this, the majority of spend goes on to rental assets. Um, and as you can see, we've increased the amount of rental asset investment from 4.5 to 3.6. And that's the story going back to the previous slide, also driving the items below EBITDA. And final comment just around closing net debt. So our net debt of 13.6 million, as I said, primarily driven by putting more assets on the balance sheet. Um, and we've put a reconciliation or sort of a little um, a summary underneath that. So the 39,000 renters, the vast majority are on 12 month contracts. Therefore, this 39,000 represents approximately 12 months of cash that will come back into the business as committed revenue. And in addition to the cash, we'll also expect to get the handsets back from the renters as well. So not only the cash from the rental, but when the contract ends, we get the actual handsets back, which come back to the business, able to sell and we'd liquidate for cash. So after depreciating on a forecast, we'd expect 6 million from the handsets. So a gross debt, 13.6. But if we allow for this rental runoff or the cash that comes back from renters, um, we satisfy ourselves that managed to a debt of nearer to 3.6. And this also kind of highlights where our debt is going. This debt is being put onto the balance sheet in terms of rental assets to drive future growth and future EBITDA for the business. I think that's a really important distinction that we felt like we should try and educate our listeners more on today that we we know this is rather hypothetical because you would only really get that benefit on a day that we stopped doing rental where you would then get that cash waterfall in from the contracts that are committed and then also the value of those assets back but you know if we were a finance house we may be building a net debt uh, but we would have a debtor book of people who were then committed to pay that finance house back. It is not a dissimilar concept 
you know, there seems to be a little bit of a misconception out there that we've in some way frittered this money away and we're just building debt. Well, we are building a very significant asset book of, as it says there, eight and a half million up to today's date on our balance sheet, along with this committed rent uh, cash flow uh, in after that. So we did want to just draw that distinction and say, hey, you know, we are very aware of this net debt number, especially given the interest rate situation. I'm going to talk in a moment about what we're doing in terms of balancing outright sales and spread the cost sales where we can book the cash and the sales and EBITDA up front because the credit company that we're working with, PayPal or Klarna, are going to take that credit risk. But equally, the rental, as you all know, if you've heard me talk before, is where I believe the real future of the business is going to be in terms of growing that shareholder value for all of us over the medium to long term. But I hope that was helpful just to see that equation for perhaps the first time. I guess my final comment just before I talk about the strategies is to reiterate Matt's message there. My football analogy, if you have heard me talk before, you know, I had a reasonable season this season being a City fan. But my football analogy is the half was in two halves. As Matt said, challenges early on with postal strikes. I think as well as that cutoff date, Matt, it just undermined consumer confidence in buying online. And I think a number of us went back to supermarkets, etc. cetera. Um, and particularly um, weak consumer demand in January. I've been in retail 25 years and it happens every January, but it seemed pretty severe. Since then, we've really built muscle momentum in the business. Focus on gross margin, focus on gross profit, focus on cost control. We've had a real uh, thorough review of all our costs. Um, and, you know, we are trading 42% up on our EBITDA in Q2. And that has continued. We're now, what, six, seven, eight weeks into, six or seven weeks, into the new H, H2. And that trading momentum has continued into H2. It does feel like we've got good momentum. I'm spoiling my own outlook slide now, which is the last one, but we're confident of hitting expectations. As Matt just recognised, there is a waiting in, in, in H2. We recognise that's very traditional for us, but we're in a good place to, uh, to bring that through. So let me finish before Q&A by just going, I think there's one or at most two slides about each of the pillars, buy, sell, rent. That's a little worrying, our fire alarm's going off and we've already had our fire drill today. So um, I am going to speak through it and I hope that um, you can hear me. I can't hear myself very well, but I will continue just for a, a few moments on buy um, and buying is really our kiosk are gaining hugely good momentum. As you know, if you've heard me talk before, we've got nearly 300 across our ASDA estate, but they're not just in ASDAs. We're now putting them into other high footfall locations. Anybody in the Northwest near us, we have one in the Trafford Centre. If you are in the Trafford Centre and you need the toilet, you'll find it. It's on the corridor down there. It's got huge footfall. It's become one of our most visited um, kiosk. We're going to be rolling out into other shopping centres, other high footfall locations, no names to throw out there now, um, but that will come later. Just to remind you what these kiosks do, they allow you to sell your phone in under five minutes. You can literally pay for your shopping that day in store with the proceeds of selling your phone. This is attracting those people who may ne have never sold their phone. The biggest competitor we face in terms of us buying phones is apathy. And it's encouraging those people by playing the advert in front of them on the top digital screen. This kiosk is seven foot tall, you can't miss it. And the digital screen at the top constantly rotates the advert. So we are getting some really good branding benefit as well. <clears throat> we are working on the walk up journey to make it even smoother, even slicker. But a little just sub note at the bottom there, internally we talk about buy more, sell more, rent more. In brackets, after the buy more, is for less. We're very focused on our margin. We want to give this great consumer champion service, but actually, we, we now um, resell 400,000 consumer tech devices a year. If we can change the unit economics on that by £10, you can do the maths that's transformational to our margin equation. So we've introduced two consumers, having tested it thoroughly, 
the request for a small admin fee to get paid quicker to have the convenience of the kiosk. And that's been introduced very successfully in the last few weeks. So that helps enhance that gross margin equation still further. But when we talk about our margin, Matt re may, uh, mentioned before, I'm going to come on to talk about our store in a second. Selling more on our store helps. Buying more from consumers helps. This admin fee is going to help um, fuels further gross uh, margin growth in the future. So very excited about what the kiosk is doing for us. I think they're now maturing. Of course, people aren't in market every time they walk in front of one of these, but they can see them and they're coming back to them. I've stood in an Asda and watched people myself. It's fascinating to see people go, oh, I didn't know you could even do such a thing in terms of uh, getting cash for your old mobile phone. I think the next slide just talks about a subtle change that's on our website. Now, if you went on our website, we changed our buying grades. This is when we're buying a phone and somebody's describing their phone to us. It's a subtle change, but it's quite an important one. We think it's more open and transparent. It gives people a better guide as to how to classify their phone, which would reduce any friction when they send it in and if we disagree with that. But subtly, in going from good, poor, faulty to excellent, good, poor, what we're looking to do is moving some of our buying from our top category to our middle category, where there's a small price differential. Again, we're looking at every pound of that unit economics. And actually, if we can move and migrate some people into that new good category, what it allows us to do is actually pay a bit more for the excellent ones. For the ones in pristine condition, we can pay a bit more and hence make our offer, our headline offer, even more attractive. Two or three additional other quick things just to mention. There's been a lot of talk about back market in Music Max buys two and a bit years on the market. Back market, as most of you know, is a marketplace. It's like an eBay for refurbished technology. We are one of the largest sellers on there, although it's uh, come back a bit in terms of the amount of activity and we're not doing as many low margin sales on there. They've also launched what is effectively a price comparison site. So you can go on back market to see who's uh, buying your phones. And again, we are, we've gone on there, both US and UK, and we're using that as an acquisition channel in exactly the same way as a selling channel. Um, emerging corporate relationships. So this is corporate selling into us and recycling into us. Talked before about the corporate's main agenda is ESG and governance. They are less bothered about the cost and, and cash. And unlike a consumer, they are bothered about hearing that every phone they recycle saves 57 kilos of carbon and that we will give them a certified data wipe. Still fairly small, still nascent, still less than 5% of our buying, but growing. Keep an eye on it. And the final point is there, and this has helped drive the margin. We were buying some wholesale product from other mobile phone uh, distributors. Less of that now. They generally fuel lower margin sales. So look, guys, we acknowledge this isn't a revenue growth story. I, I read with interest John Roberts, who I know up the road from me here, and similar tale, really, a, a small revenue decline, but a focus on profitable sales and cost control. So you know, that's very much where, where we've been. I think just one slide on, on sales, and I'm keen to get into the questions. You've heard from both of us about how we're looking to bring the emphasis back to our own store. We're back to 79% of our sales happening on store. Um, that got us low as 70%, probably this time last year when I was sat here talking to you. We are bringing in an enhanced buy now, pay later that will sit next to our rental offer. So for those value seeking customers who are looking to spread the cost, working with the two biggest uh, buy now, pay later brands in the UK, we can now give them directly three options. Buy outright, and I'm going to use the example of a £400 phone. It won't be exactly right, but I won't be far off. A £400 phone, buy it outright, rent it for £20 a month, or you can do a spread to cost, buy now, pay later. And you can change the period that you can do that deal with. Now, actually, a couple of things to say there. We've always been very choosy about who we let through our rental offer. We get 400 applications a day for our rental offer, but we let no more than 20% of people through. So there's a number of people who've come to do that offer, spread the cost, who haven't been able to. We're now going to complement uh, that 
with a buy now, pay later offer. And you may already know this, but typically a buy now, pay later provider will accept about 50 to 60% of people who look to apply through them. They know a lot more people. They've both got many, many millions of registered users. So complement the rental. That, of course, will then consist and effectively be, for counting purposes, an outright sale, bring the cash in, and they take the credit risk with those customers. And they're not just to the marketplaces. They have gone down in our sales mix, but they're very much there. And Walmart in the States that you will, may have heard us mention a couple of times is, again, small but growing. And it's a really interesting partnership that we've formed with Walmart. They have actually formed a certified refurbished section on their site that we are now selling uh, our product through, just in the States, obviously, at the moment. One slide, I think, just on rent before we just finish off with Outlook. Um, as I said before, this is very much, you know, this is what I'm excited about in our business, but we do appreciate we have to handle this carefully, manage it with the net debt situation, even though we've offered that explanation of the asset base that we're building. But here's some updated stats for you. We've now got 39,000 uh, subscribers. That's up from 24,000. Average subscription has stayed at £20. We have got some corporate devices out there now. Again, that's a, a growing part of our business. We've got over a thousand with Stagecoach. We've had other contracts coming in. We need to build that into the mix with the consumer rentals. You can imagine we talk a lot about would we rather have one contract from a, a corporate of a thousand devices or a thousand consumers who do one each? The answer is if the corporates are high, are high quality, blue chip, governance, uh, covenants, et cetera, sorry, Matt would probably say, I'll take the corporate deal, thank you. But I think you all know what it is. You rent it, it's flexible, it's affordable. And at the end of the year, you can give that phone back or you can renew it and keep the same device and take a discount or you can give it to us back and trade up and take the next phone up. Customers love it. It's very popular. We are now, obviously, we've got two years worth of renewal data to look at. And again, that's probably encouraged us just to uh, look at, uh, at letting those quality customers through um, the credit check for our rental offer and segment um, people into buy now, pay later as an offer. Um, but, um, you know, exactly the same, but we, we are still very excited about this offer. This is not step, us stepping down or away from rental, but we do appreciate we have to handle it responsibly and sensibly. So I'll just finish by reiterating the outlook. Um, it is tough out there. You know, again, that's what I've been talking to the journals about. Um, and, you know, there are cost of living pressures. But we were born in a recession. We started in my garage doing cash for CDs and DVDs. And Martin Lewis covered our business extensively. He sat on the couch of GMTV and promoted our business. It's a great way for consumers to raise cash. That was in 2009. He's still promoting our business now as a way for consumers and indeed corporates to raise cash and save money when buying or renting. We're very focused, guys, on our gross margin, driving gross profit growth, which we have, and, and putting some cost savings through, getting the blend of extra sales through, spreading the cost alongside that rental offer. And as I've mentioned, we are weighted towards H2. That's perfectly normal. And we have good evidence of having delivered that over the last two or three years. So lots to do in H2 strong momentum, good trading in that second quarter of the half, and that's continued into this year. So we are confident of hitting those full year expectations. So I hope that gave us a, a good overview. Um, I'm really happy to take questions now because I think I've, we've held it to half an hour. Perfect, Steve. Matt, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Dashboard. As you can see, we've received a number of questions, both pre-submitted and through to today's presentation. And Matt, if I could just hand over to you just to read out the questions and chair the Q&A, what I'll do is I'll pick up from you at the end. Okay, thank you. Um, so Steve, I can see a few questions here pre-submitted are quite long. I'll try and, and summarize, but starting off, um, 
market cap. Um, you said in a previous interview that Magpie could get to 1 billion market cap. Do you still expect this? And how do you think we'll get there? Um, yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> call me the optimist, and I, and I am. But very realistically, I do have that vision for this business. I hope you can all sense again on this call. I'm the biggest shareholder still. I'm very much aligned with you. And I've never been more excited about Music Magpie. Did I envisage that we would have a world of COVID, Brexit, Putin, now, you know, inflationary pressures and, and mortgages? Well, no, no, none of us did. And actually, but some of that is reasonably, you know, encourages customers to come and seek value out more. I think, you know, very simply, I always imagine that that million pound market cap, like any other business out there, would be driven by uh, a multiple of a good, strong, recurring revenue and, and EBITDA um, uh, going through those numbers. So, you know, it's going to take us a little longer, but absolutely, I've got that confidence. We can we can do it. Um, we're very, very focused on what we're doing. There is other possibilities for the future in terms of territories and product categories. That's for the future. That's not to talk about now. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is around social media. So um, social media presence, um, the, the quester says we have none and then goes on to say, you know, really, why hasn't we got a Twitter account in particular? So just interested around social media and our views on Twitter, I guess. Um, uh, I'll try and keep political comment to a, a minimum about um, Elon Musk and what I perceive um, tw Twitter to be these days, which is um, a, a weird, wonderful place at times. Um, personally, I'm, I'm on there and just to, to talk about football on there generally. Um, the, the business, to be honest, it, it, it's a high um, social media platform to service. Um, and you do get every man and his dog on there um, talking about this. It, uh, unfortunately, that's just not correct to say we've got no social media presence. We take our communication with our stakeholders, whether that's customers, colleagues or uh, or shareholders or potential shareholders very seriously. We have 6,000 followers on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is a much more appropriate social media platform to be talking about investor updates, getting my view on the world. Music Magpie's account, and indeed my own, regularly talks about you know interviews that I've done, market news, awards that we've won, things that we've done with the community, etc. So please come and see us and engage with us on LinkedIn. And, you know, we're very open to having two-way conversation on that. But, and we're always interested to hear from you. But it is on LinkedIn and, and not on Twitter. Maybe threads in the future if uh, if they deliver some of their ethical promises that they're not going to go down the same path as, uh, as Twitter. But I do see Twitter as more of a place for consumers to rant and rave. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question, similar trend, but uh, more formally around our RNSs. So um, uh, uh, Magpie's RNSs are very infrequent. Um, and is there anything we need to do or should be doing around boosting the number of RNSs that we issue? Yeah, I might, I might bounce that one back to you in a second, Matt, because I think we work together on that and with our brokers, sure, on what is RNSable. I'm sure that's not a word. Um, but I think, you know, whenever we think there's a significant enough update, you know, whether that be a new corporate client, et cetera, um, we, we do a little update um, with an RNS. Um, Matt, I, I guess, you know, is there anything that we feel like we could have uh, done more in terms of RNS? But I, I think we get it about right, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, so RNS is supposed to be for material items. So there are kind of rules around when you can issue them. Um, if we've got something that's a bit more, um, PR or more informative and less material will tend to use an RNS reach. Um, and then in addition, there are other forms that we use to publicate um, and publish out to other people using our PR firm. So I think we, we try and use it and we do use it as much as we can. Um, and it's just one of the tools we use when we try and market and publish uh, our story. Um, Next question. Um, I see you did advertise on GBTV, but nowhere else. Why? <laughs> it's definitely, if you did happen to have the misfortune of following me on Twitter, you would definitely pick up that's not of my political persuasion. Uh, both I and the business has social conscience. Um, I, uh, I, I'd be horrified to think that we were on that. I think I, um, 
Uh, if we did, it will have been one rogue advert. And uh, yeah, we've done our very best not to be uh, on the mail or sun. Or listen, I promised I wouldn't go down the political angle, but um, no, it's um, we we do do a number of brand um, advertising on uh, a range of different channels. Uh, you know, whether that be um, TikTok these days, or VOD, or social media, or YouTube adverts, as well as a little bit of TV in the mix still. But generally, uh, you know, I'm surprised somebody's seen it on that. If somebody had said they'd seen it on Sky News, uh, I would be very, very unsurprised because we like Sky News. People watch it live. They don't fast forward it. They don't record it. They're engaged with it. They're potentially distractible because it's just on in the background. So, um, but no, uh, GB, GB, GBB's News, I think they call it, don't they, if you're being rude? Not for me. Okay. Um, next question. I'm not going to um, try and sidestep this one. I'm just going to read it as it is. It says, I haven't seen anyone use the Asda drop in the Trafford Centre and it even had dust on it. Um, why don't you advertise it more, get some flashing lights or have a promotional person to show people how to use it? Um, if it carries on raining, I might be going to do, I might have, uh, have to go to Trafford Centre this weekend. I will take a cloth. Um, I'm not being flippant about that because there's a good point in that one somewhere. And it's, um, it's the promo element of that. And um, it's something we have been discussing, isn't it, Matt, in terms of actually would it pe help people's education? You know, we all know if Matt Vitti's launching it or there's a new drink, you occasionally can get promo staff handing out samples in aisles, et cetera. I think we will probably at some stage try some sort of, you know, especially maybe in summer with students around, a bit of promo presence just to say, hey, have you seen the kiosk? Um, I mean, I hope you wouldn't miss it. It's taller than me. It's seven foot tall, and there's a big digital screen at the top saying, get cash for your old mobile phone here. So I don't think we need fairy lights, et cetera. But, um, yeah, I will I will revisit the clan at this point because, you know, we do want it to be presented right. But, um, no, we, we, you know, they're a big part of our future. And I think a little trial of, of, of doing a bit of promo assistance around it is potentially interesting. Okay. Um, there's a question here. I'll sort of read it so you're aware what I'm answering, but it's, it's more for myself, I think. So yeah. given you have a U.S. business, would you look to list in the U.S. OTC, um, giving its broader shareholder base? Um, the cost to list in the market is minimal, um, brackets $50,000, and the benefits um, would be more reflective in the business. Um, so, yeah, we have actually looked at OTC and will continue to do so. Um, in terms of the fee, I would just sort of caveat, you know, the listing fees a little bit more than that. And then you've got to think about having your advisors and then if you need to publish your market. So, you know, it's, it's not just that headline rate. There's, there's a lot more cost to support it. When we have looked at it and looked at the type of investors against the type of business we are, there isn't a direct match. So it's not like we would see ourselves as a great fit for OTC, um, but we will continue to um, look at it periodically in terms of a next step. Um, another question, um, how does the average value of devices traded in at a kiosk compare with those traded in online? Yeah, OK, that's, a, that's a, an interesting one, actually, isn't it, Matt? Because we talk about the fact that I think actually in one of our previous presentations, an early presentation, we noted that increased value. That's not to say we pay more for the same device at a kiosk, but people are trading in higher value devices. I think that talks to convenience, speed, and in particular that word trust, that they are getting paid instantly for that device. That's continued, so it's slightly higher perhaps not quite as much now because people are starting to really get into the mainstream um, with the kiosk. So our average purchase price hovers around the 250, 260. Um, perhaps it might be you know, 10, 15, 20% more than that, for the kiosk. Um, but yeah, we, we are seeing that you know mainstream devices coming through it more, although the percentage of product that arrives into our business, I think, I hope I've already said this, is nearly 50% of our UK tech now in value comes through the kiosk. And actually that's driven, it's it's a smaller number in terms of percentage of units and volume than value because it is higher value uh, units that are coming through. So um, I think that does talk to the trust of them. 
So I've got I'm just scanning down. I've got a couple more on kiosks. So I'll just just mm. um, try and collate them together. So, um, how many smart drop kiosks do you see being deployed per year moving forward? And what's the investment needed to deploy? Yeah, another hot topic in our business, isn't it, Matt? Um, so we're at 300 now. Most of those are in Asda's. Um, there are no more planned for this financial year, so no more capex and, and, and no more rollout sitting here today for the rest of this year. Where do I think, where do we think this could go? Um, we are looking at other partnerships. So I feel like we're slightly underrepresented in certain geographical areas where there perhaps isn't so many as does. So we're looking at the Southeast in particular. My chairman, Martin Hanel Hallowell says, there's not an Asda within 15 minutes drive of my house. And I proved to him there is, but he has to do it at two o'clock in the morning. Um, so we're looking for other high footfall locations. I think, you know, we could get real good penetration um, and get exactly where we want to go, get it in front of the general public's eyes with a large number of hundreds of kiosks. Now, I think that the reality of that, it would be rolled out over a period of time. Uh, and as we look forward strategically into next year, I think there'll be another roll uh, of those kiosks. And I suspect it will end up, Matt, and you've probably got your own view on this because they cost about £6,000 each, but they're giving us a good ROI um, to, to look to potentially keep expanding that rollout next year. Okay. And, and the follow-up question, or maybe it's just a suggestion, is what about positioning in universities? And I hadn't actually thought about that, but potentially that is an area we could uh, think about high footfall, although we wouldn't want to cope with a... Uh, summer semester where we don't see any uh, activity uh that's true but i do like it i do you know i think that's interesting um you know students younger folk are early tech adopters generally although some of them haven't got much money so the both of those things perhaps encourage um the the trading in and the uh, getting cash for your old device um i think as you just said matt we want places that transport hubs shopping centers other high street retailers maybe look to a partner who's got town centre and city centre presence. If we've got out of town as the presence, um, I think there's a range of options. We're not ready to talk about, you know, announcing who the next partner would be. But as we both know, there's some really interesting ones going on. Okay. Um, I think I possibly take this next one myself, but it says, can you give guidance on the number or percentage of rental customers defaulting and how you mitigate against this? Um, so actually, the um, sort of proxy for defaults in the accounts you'll see is our impairment charge, which is for the rental assets. So you can compare that impairment charge to the value of assets to come out with a with a metric. Um, we manage or we price in uh, in the region of 10%. Um, and we mitigate this. There's a range of things we do. People coming into the funnel, um, credit rates, uh, credit ratings. And also when people go delinquent, there's a number of steps we take to manage like you would with any um, in inverted commas loan. So I think we have a good handle on it. Steve talked about buy now, pay later and the interaction with rental. Uh, and we're evolving the uh, rental proposition and looking at the credit scores and the quality of the renters all the time. And um, so we managing this this metric down and we have an aspiration to reduce that down into clearly into single figures. Um, Steve, one back for you. Is the focus more on the UK brand or the US? And have you any plans to expand internationally, either directly or through partnership? Yeah, really good question that. And I think, uh, you know, listeners and viewers who know the business know we have our US brand, Declutter, uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. And frankly, we don't talk about it much. And that's not because we're ashamed of it or we, uh, there's, it's, it's problematic in any way. It's a relatively um, modest part of the group turnover. I think it's about 20, low 20%, Matt, of our group turnover. Um, it doesn't make money, a great deal of money. It doesn't lose money, more importantly. And I think it is fair to say, a lesson we learned from IPO guys was that I think Ian and I at the time were perhaps guilty about pebble dashing information and talking about everything that we thought was great about Music Magpie. And Declutter is one of those things. I think, you know, the focus, and to answer the question directly, we're very focused on the UK brand and activity, strategic growth strategy activity in the UK. So kiosk, rental, corporate. But take those learnings, take the development from them, and then look to research it thoroughly into the US market. 
and work out, hey, is there a, an opportunity for our kiosk over there? Most people in the US, if they are trading in their phone, do it with their network partner, so a Sprint or a Verizon. Um, so, you know, is there an opportunity to partner up or indeed to leverage the Walmart relationship to think about kiosk? Is there an opportunity to look at the rental? Well, yes, there is, and a very sizable one. It's a bigger market, obviously, like everything else, it's four times bigger over there uh, than it is here. But actually, most people are doing that activity with the network, so can we go and do something with them? So long-winded answer, apologies, focus on the UK. All our growth strategies are in play here, but please don't think we've abandoned the declutter and we're not talking about it for a reason. There's not a lot happening over there. And Matt, I think the financial performance of declutter pretty much mirrored the group. Revenue down a bit, margin up, uh, gross profit pretty steady, some cost savings going through it. Um, and therefore, you know, actually it's it's doing just a modest return for us, but it's it's um, it's there for us uh, as a base for future. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions here on debt, so I'll sort of ask the question to myself, but uh, the questions sort of broadly around um, uh, when do you expect the net debt to peak? Um, when do you expect to get to net cash? And um, if I just, sorry, if I just read down, uh, what would, could your net debt go to if Black Friday or Christmas are not as good as expected due to um, market confidence? Um, so I'll sort of do those in the, the order they're asked. So our expectation is for uh, net debt to peak during 2024. However, it won't be a huge peak above 2023 levels owing to what we're evolving around the rental strategy. We're not aggressively driving growth and we have moderate growth plans so that there will be a peak in 24, but it's not a high peak. In terms of when we start to um, pay down, uh, debt or start to pay back debt that will be in 2025 the question about black friday um i guess probably before answering it directly um we look at cash and we look at performance of sales daily and we the lever we have on debt is the acceleration or deceleration of rental so in one scenario if black friday and we did nothing then you can see um debt getting very high but we don't see that happening we look at debt daily we look at cash daily we would take appropriate corrective action well before um, we saw that happening we have pipelines and we see where revenue is coming from so you know it it could get slightly higher than it is now but we would see it coming and we would take corrective action i think my comment as well matt is to remind people that um, black friday is far from a day the, <clears throat> excuse me a day these days it's not a week it's a month uh, as is Christmas. And uh, we talked about, you know, some of those logistics issues and Royal Mail in particular strikes uh, causing his issues and undermining c consumer confidence. Um, you know, a question that was asked just after Christmas was, why didn't you just use somebody else? It's like, well, everybody, literally everybody tried to do that. But also consumers just lost confidence in logistics. It was falling over. But we have got many more contingencies in place now. Um, to uh, uh, look to take our logistics if needed. But I think I'd just reiterate Matt's words. This is something that we monitor and run our business on meticulously. Um, and, you know, the ultimate in our business is that we thin our rental out to virtually nothing and just promote the buy now, pay later heavier. And, you know, we're trying to get that balance right between driving a medium to long term shareholder value return with the rental benefit uh, versus that short term. And it's something that myself and Matt and Ian, who many of you know from previous recordings, uh, literally spend uh, a disproportionate of our amount, uh, amount of our day looking at. Um, another question that I think I'll take myself, Steve, is, is rental profitable at the moment, taking into account depreciation? If not, when do you think it will be? Uh, well, I think the short answer is yes, it is profitable. Um, we price into our um, um, rentals to both corporate and customers uh, and then an allowance for depreciation, an allowance for interest, profit, delinquency. So it is profitable. 
The gross margin that we report in the accounts, 84% coming off rental. And even when you add our depreciation of the assets, which comes in at 33%, we still have 50% gross margin there to cover all the other items I mentioned. So it is um, currently profitable. Um, another question, Steve, what's your view on the macro or market trend, sorry, in the numbers of people coming off network packages and onto SIM only deals? Will that benefit Magpie? Um, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I think actually we're helping to facilitate that. Um, uh, Self-referencing is dangerous, isn't it? Um, but I'm going to do it. Uh, family Oliver used to pay about £160 a month for our to EE for five phones that they'd left us asleep on. And frankly, a fairly rubbish data package that we had to constantly top up. So uh, unsurprisingly, perhaps a little while ago now, I said, hang on a minute. We need to go and buy or rent some handsets for, for ourselves. And I phoned DE back and said, we just want an airtime deal now. And we got an all-you-can-eat data share for the whole family for like 40, 45 pounds a month. So, um, you know, if we've ended up, and this is what more and more people are doing, we've done it as a business as well. And I should, you know, emphasize that corporates can do this as well. We mentioned our partner before, our network airtime uh, uh, broker, this is what they're doing for businesses. They're going in and saying, you're paying X. If you split that down, um, you can save money, get a better device, a better airtime deal and save money. And actually, you can trade in your old ones and get paid instantly, which pays for the first few months of that. So 50% um, of the UK population have now split their SIM away from their handset and just do an airtime deal. 10 years ago, that was zero. Five years ago, that was... 25, 30%, it's about to tip over to more people than not are doing that. And I think our rental offer, our buy now, pay, pay later offer, even more fuels and facilitates that concept where people can save money and get a better deal. And to coin another one of our trademark strap, marks, strap lines, why wouldn't you? Uh, why wouldn't you do that and save money and get a better, a better deal? So just looking down, Steve, I think I've got two left, both of which are, are quite interesting. So I've rented an iPhone. Why can't I buy it at the end of the contract? I'm likely to stop the rental and buy elsewhere. Um, I think you tell me, Matt, that if you could buy it, it wouldn't be classed as a rental um, in the same way. I'm learning, Matt, I'm learning. <laughs> um, I think that would start to fall into a kind of lease purchase uh, deal rather than a lease rental uh, arrangement effectively you can do what you've just described albeit you know you can't uh you know you can't potentially keep the same one if you do want to buy it you can continue to use it for a reduced rental so in a, in a world where all your subscriptions are going up this one we're offering you a discount to take it but now if that's what you want to do you can pay the same equivalent charge but spread the cost on a buy now pay later and at the end of that agreement that phone will be yours, so you have bought it. So we're trying to, again, offer that consumer choice to enable people to do both. Okay, and then the final question, have you considered partnering with an MNO, so for those who don't know, mobile network operator, to manage their trading program to increase the numbers of, numbers of product coming from the end users? Um, short answer is yes. Um, so John Miller, our chief commercial officer, is, is of that background himself. He knows the industry in that world very well indeed. My slight caveat, my slight why wouldn't Music Magpie do that is, what they generally ask you to do is commit to a quarter at a time with a fixed price. And that is a big commitment. And suddenly there can be a big cash flow implication into that where many thousands of phones start to arrive where if the market's moved and you've gone out with a price that has won the business, ow, that hurt, um, I'm going to do single, um, where you've won the business, but now you're committed to paying that price. Now, our whole pricing model, our whole technology is fluid and it's run off algorithms. And literally, we're buying and selling each device depending on days forward cover, what price it's selling for in the market, et cetera, every day. You would be committing yourselves to buying a lot of stock, a lot of cash. And I'm afraid our industry is littered with bad examples of that where P 
people have caught colds with an, um, badly priced inventory that they're committed to buying. So you do have to be careful. We're not discounting that possibility. There is some interesting conversations uh, with the networks. Um, but I will just finish by saying Music Magpie does pay more than the networks. If you sat there thinking, why doesn't I, I do that with my phone? Well, have a look next time. We pay generally about 15% more than the network would for, for their phone. Uh, for your phone apologies so yeah hope that hope that answered the question how are we looking matt that's it all the questions are um, yeah. finished thank you yeah, yeah. we've been submitted steve matt thank you very much for that i think you actually did manage to address every question from investors and of course the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the investor me company platform but just before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback which i know is particularly important to you both Steve, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I hope what you've heard from us today is, look, you know, it's a tough world out there, but Magpie's constantly serviced and indeed thrives in times of difficult economic conditions. Um, we are a consumer champion service. We allow people to raise cash for their old product and save money when buying and renting from us. We recognise that. But we're very focused on those two or three key elements that we talked about. And really driving through that gross margin, creating more gross profit for ourselves, cost review constantly in our business. Good that we have got, have got our Outlook slide on. And I'm just going to mention one more time that lovely word in life, business, and indeed Man City's football season, if you forgive me that a moment. It was momentum, getting on a winning run, 20 games uh, uh, successive. It's, it, you know, that second quarter... Um, was 42% up. We continue to trade well. Um, it feels like we've got some good momentum going into that second half. And actually those strategies that we talked about, we're giving you some more information on today, uh, are starting to pay some dividend for us. So, you know, it is a tough world out there, but I think we're really well placed to, uh, to face the challenges and, and confident for the full year end expectations. Perfect. Steve, Matthew, thanks once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Music Magpie PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all. Thanks very much for joining us.